Hello everyone and you are very welcome back to another video. My name is Amy, I'm a musician, I play guitar and I sing and I make videos that consist mostly of cover songs, guitar content, vlogs. <laughs> Odie, you're making a habit out of this. And I also just really enjoy talking about music and music related things. So today's video is going to be more of a story time. I am going to tell you all about the time that I was in a movie about Jimi Hendrix. I think it's quite an interesting story, so I thought I would make a good video. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the movie first, how I got cast as an extra because it was a little bit random how it all happened. I'm gonna tell you about the shoot days and what it was like on the set and from more of a behind the scenes perspective. And towards the end of the video, I'm going to to show you some clips of the scenes I was in. I don't know how long this is going to take. It is quite a long story. I am gonna try and be as concise as I can, but when I'm editing this, I have no idea how long this is gonna be. This could end up being more of a podcast length. Who knows? But at this point, I would suggest grab a cup of tea, grab a snack, get cozy, or put me on in the background while you are doing some chores, getting some stuff ready for Christmas, or maybe you're just practicing some scales, whatever. So first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the film itself. Now I am in no means a film critic, so I am going to be channeling my inner Chris Stuckman for this next part. I'm such a huge fan of his now, thanks to my husband. The film is titled Jimmy All Is By My Side, a biopic telling the tale of the beginnings of an unknown guitarist Jimi Hendrix, set in the 60s, specifically 1966, where Jimi Hendrix leaves New York City for London, where his career ultimately explodes. We have Andre Benjamin, or Andre 3000, starring as Jimi Hendrix. Us millennials know him as the guy from Outcast. And his resemblance to Jimi Hendrix is actually pretty crazy. We also have Hayley Atwell, who plays Kathy Etchingham, his girlfriend at the time, and we have Imogen Poots as Linda Keith, who discovered him and introduced him to Chaz Chandler. Also, as a quick side note, while I was researching this video, I found out that Linda Keith is actually a first cousin of Paul Kossoff, the guitar player from Free. I didn't know that, so... You learn something new every day. It was written and directed by John Ridley and first screened at the Toronto International Film Festival and South by Southwest Film Festival in 2013 and didn't see a release date in Ireland and the UK until the following year, 2014. The filming that I was involved in took place in 2011, so not until three years later did I get to see any of it. Hey guys, editing me here. I just wanted to interrupt the video quickly to correct a mistake. So I had 2011 in my head for all of this happening, but I've since realized that 2011 was the year I started college and this was happening the following summer. So it actually would have been 2012, not 2011. And this makes sense because I turned 20 in the summer of 2012. So just wanted to correct that for this video. Going forward, whenever I say 2011, I mean 2012. I realized that during editing. So apologies for getting that wrong. Appreciate your understanding. Let's resume the video. When the film was released, I ended up purchasing a DVD copy from Amazon just to have, and I do still have it, but not on me right now. It is actually on my DVD and bookshelf back in my old bedroom in my parents' house in Ireland. So next time I'm home, I will dig it out and I'll show it to you in a vlog or something. So the film was received medium. It has a 5.7 star rating on IMDb, a 65% rating on Rotten Tomatoes with a 36% audience score. I was telling my husband about this video when I was planning it and he, laughed at me for calling it Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> Now, some people did like the movie, but some of the main criticisms that the film faced was that for a movie about Jimi Hendrix, it contained absolutely none of his music. Now, I will say in their defense, they did try to get permission and to get the rights to the music, but the Jimi Hendrix estate 
denied. Mainly because if somebody wants to make a movie about Jimi Hendrix and they want to use his music, the estate wanted at least some creative control in the project and the production company did not want that. So the family said no and the movie ended up using covers that Jimi Hendrix did, such as Sgt. Pepper. Also, the real Kathy Etchingham was apparently not consulted during production, so according to her, there were a lot of inaccuracies with regards to her relationship relationship with Jimi Hendrix and how that was portrayed. It was, in general, overly dramatised and, in particular, a scene which involves domestic A-B-U-S-E that she said never happened. So moving on to how I got cast as the oh-so-important part of Extra. I do want to quickly mention as well that this happened 12 years ago. I don't remember every single part of the story and some of my memory is quite hazy, especially with regards to communicating with casting and how I actually was scheduled in the end for the shoot days. I just don't remember some of those details. I apologize if some of this doesn't fully make sense, but like I said, I will explain as best I can and I will point out the parts that I don't remember. I'm going to take you back to 2000. 2011, I am 19 years old, about to turn 20. I am coming towards the final term of my first year at college. I went to college in Dublin to a place called BIM, which stands for Brighton and Bristol Institute of Modern Music. 2011 was the year that they opened the Dublin branch, so I was among the first class of graduates from BIM in 2015. I was so unbelievably lucky that this college opened the year I did the Leaving Cert. All I ever wanted was music, so I got my Bachelor of Arts in Commercial Modern Music. So the first year is coming to an end. The summer holidays are approaching, so it's sometime in May. At the end of every term, now I know I have a lot of Americans watching me, so semester as you call it, BIM puts on what they call the end of term gig, which is basically a live music event for the students and the tutors if they want, but is also open for anyone to attend if you pay a small cover charge at the door. Now how you got to play at the gig was decided by one of our end of term exams. Everyone basically had to assemble into a band or bands and perform a cover song or an original song of your choice to a a panel of tutors to be graded and assessed. The guitar tutor assesses the guitar student, drum tutor assesses the drum student, bass tutor the bass student, vocals, you get the idea. You were basically graded on your individual part by your tutor, how well your part fit with the band and complemented the song, and also just in general, the overall performance of the band. This assessment also doubled as an audition for the end of term gig. So based on that performance, a bunch of bands were selected for the lineup for the gig. The band I was in, we did a cover of No One Knows by Queens of the Stone Age, was picked. So it's May 2011, it's the afternoon of the end of term gig, and we are all at the Button Factory in Dublin doing sound check. Sound check finishes, we're told to leave the venue for a couple of hours, I'm sure a bunch of music students all in a venue, finishing up sound check, we're just getting in the way of the staff at that point. So we're told to clear off, get some food, be back in a couple hours, but well before the doors open. A group of us, including me, what? <laughs> That's a group of us, apparently. A group of us, including me, maybe 10 or 12 of us, leave the venue together and we walk across to Meeting House Square and we just sit on the ground for a few hours and hang out. We look like musicians or music students even. I'm probably guessing I was wearing like a red checked shirt black skinny jeans and Converse. You're picturing it right. So we're hanging out for a little bit and then we are approached by two people holding clipboards, a man and a woman, I would have guessed maybe both in their early 30s. Now this is the first part that is hazy in my memory because I don't remember specifically what was said, but it was along the lines of, we're casting for a movie, we're looking for extras, you guys look like what we're looking for, you have the look. I doubt they would have specified the movie, I don't think they did, but I think they did say that it was music or guitar related. Give us a quick pitch. It was paid work, so anyone who's interested will take your details. Now I know how this sounds. <laughs> You're approached in a big city by people with clipboards, they want to take your name and your number. It sounds really sketchy, I know. I kind of didn't know if this was anything. I think I was less skeptical of their intentions since they approached us as a group 
rather than if it was just me by myself. But it did end up checking out. They were legit. They were genuinely scouting for people. It seems a bit random, I know. <laughs> the woman looked at me specifically and was like, I really like your look. <laughs> My hair was similar to what it is like now, although it was probably straight as usual. Still had the bangs, the fringe. It was very similar to this. I really haven't changed my hair that much in 12 years. But she was like, we really like your long hair. We like your fringe or your bangs. And yeah, you just, you have what we're looking for. <laughs> Now that I'm retelling this story, this sounds so weird. Like it sounds so sketchy and kidnappy, <laughs> but it actually wasn't. But they said for me, like they kind of singled me out and was like, we have a specific part in mind for you, which to jump forward for a second, actually ended up not making sense because they did end up having an issue with my hair, but I will, I'll get to that in a little bit. So also this next part is extremely hazy to me. I cannot for the life of me remember the timeline at this point. I have looked back through old emails just to try and attempt to like pinpoint some dates or some correspondence with casting, but I, I cannot find anything. I can assume that a little bit of time has passed and I get a phone call. And this is the only phone call that I remember getting and it was on an old phone that I no longer have. The phone call was a casting lady. She was basically checking my availability to see if I was still interested and just giving me some details about what things might look like if I went ahead and took the job. It all sounded above board. I said yes and I was scheduled for a costume fitting the following week. And I would be told in the meantime what day I was scheduled for shooting. So the costume fitting was at Ardmore Studios in Bray. And I do remember having to travel for this. So it must have been during that summer holiday because I would have been at home in Mayo. So I would have had to travel up to Bray to attend this costume fitting. They reimbursed me for my travel expenses. I had to get a three hour train from Mayo to Dublin and then get the 145 from Houston Station to Bray, which is in Wicklow. And the studio is a couple of stops past the town of Bray. So it was gonna take me up to another hour at least to get there on top of a three hour train ride from Mayo. So it was a lot for me looking back. It was a lot of travel, but you know, I was 19 turning 20. I was doing something cool. I had my iPod at the time and my headphones. So I didn't mind. So I arrive in Ardmore Studios for the costume fitting. And I remember feeling quite scared when I got there because I had no idea where to go. I was just this little extra wandering around. <laughs> Not having a clue where she is. Wandering around outside a studio, looking for a costume fitting, completely lost. I remember feeling quite insignificant because, you know, one single extra in the grand scheme of a movie is like not a big deal and probably easily replaced. So I felt very like, uh, insignificant is a good word. And I felt intimidated to talk to anybody, but I don't want to be late for my appointment. So I pluck up the courage and I go to the guard at the front gate and I just say, hey, I'm here for this, where do I go? So he points out a building to me in the back and says, it's that way, that building, there's an open door and you'll immediately go up the stairs. And then he said, don't accidentally go to the door right next to it. It's a building that has big letters Panavision on the front. So don't go in there by accident because you will be screamed at. And he was very adamant about that. So I was like, okay, I won't go in there. <laughs> so I'm at the costume fitting for a few hours. There's a bunch of other extras there. There's a lot of waiting around, kind of waiting your turn. They have a couple of people working with different people. So they're maybe taking two at a time into different rooms to, you know, take measurements, get dress size, try on a few outfits. They, they did end up putting me in this kind of a purpley. I don't remember what it was fully, but I remember it being purple and it was kind of a, like a slim dress. The skirt style was kind of short, like a 60s short style. The other funny thing I remember about this uh, costume fitting is when we were in the little waiting room, there was a few other people there. There's a couple of people chatting and the room is so small that you actually are just kind of automatically eavesdropping on other people's conversations. You can't really help it. So I was hearing this one girl say to another girl, they were kind of talking about like acting and their acting experiences, which I had none. This one girl said, my dad was the naked man from Father Ted. And I was like, oh, <laughs> she was like, yeah, that's, that's my dad. <laughs> 
just remembered that. I was like, that's that's a funny part of this story. Just a little, little detail. So they put me with this other girl who I'm going to be like obviously doing the scene with. Still don't really know what it is at this point. We weren't actually told until we got to the set later on. They have me and this other girl together. I remember her being taller than me. They were casting us as like a blonde girl and a brunette girl and they had cast me as the blonde girl and they were kind of comparing us to these reference photos that they had. So obviously, I mean, again, I'm not a film person, but I would assume that the whoever's in charge of casting ex extras and in charge of all that stuff was like, these people that were casting need to look like this. They had to make us look as close to the reference photos as possible. And the girl in the picture that I was supposed to look as close to as possible had hair that was like up to here. It was very, very short hair. And I remember her kind of looking at me going, oh, your hair might be a problem. And I was like, okay. And she said, how would you feel about us cutting your hair? And I was like, um, no, I don't want anyone to cut my hair. Now I know it's just hair and it'll grow back, but I was very like not thrilled about that. I also don't remember how that conversation ended. I think I was afraid that if I was gonna dig my heels in too much with that, that they were just gonna tell me to go home and get somebody else. They didn't. They still scheduled me for the shoot day. I don't remember what happened after that, whether they were like, we'll figure something out or we're just gonna cut your hair anyway. I, I actually don't remember. I remember being like, no, I don't want that to happen. I remember talking about this with my mom, obviously it must've been afterwards. And I remember telling her and she was like, no, they're not cutting your hair, not for this. It's, like, it's not like you're the main character of a movie, like that would be different, but you're literally an extra in one scene. So why would you, you know, my mom's words, why would you cut your beautiful hair just for this. And I was kind of agreeing with her. I didn't want, I just didn't want that. So I was kind of telling them no, but anyways, we'll move on to the next part of the story. So the shoot day comes around. I don't remember where we had to go. I remember it being like either a pub, not, not, not like a pub, maybe a pub area of a live music venue or something like that. I don't specifically remember where. For anyone who knows Dublin, it was around the George's Arcade, Wicklow Street, Drury Street, that kind of area. And I remember being nervous because I wasn't sure about my hair at this stage. Now I was adamant about saying no, but I was afraid that they might tell me to go home. So I remember being like a bit unsure in that realm, but I was not going to let them cut it. I knew that much. So I get there and actually what they ended up doing, they had the other girl there and she was actually done. She had her makeup and hair done and her costume on. So she was ready to go. And they said, what we're gonna do is just switch your roles because actually now that her hair is done, she looks closer to your reference photo. So we have a brown wig that we're gonna put on you. And I was like, yes, perfect. Perfect, I was so happy. So my hair was fine, my hair was safe. <laughs> so she was now the blonde girl and I was the brunette. At this point now I'm getting ready, they're doing me up before they take us over to the set. And I remember, this is one bit I do remember, the lady who was doing my hair, she wasn't the nicest person, at least to me anyway. She put like a thousand pins in my hair and I was actually, it was quite cool to see it was the only time I'd worn a wig like that where I actually looked completely different. Like it was a gorgeous shade of, of brown, like a straight, you know, very 60s, bangs the same. Now I know like production and all that line of work, like it's a very busy, stressful job. It's a lot of work, it's long hours. So I understand that you don't always have time to be nice to people, I get that. But this hair lady putting the wig on me, she did have time to tell me that she thought the wig looked nicer on me than my actual natural hair. And that I should consider going for that style, cut and color after this. And I was like, did she just say that to me? But she was very like, she was going on about it. She was like, oh my gosh, like this looks way better on you than your actual hair. Now, if someone said that to me now, I'd probably just laugh or I'd tell them to go themselves. But when you're young and people say stuff about your appearance and the way you look and people point stuff out, it hurts and you internalize that. So I remember feeling quite upset on the inside at this point. I was hurt that she said that, but 
I decided ultimately just to shake it off and embrace the rest of the day. So hair and makeup are done. We are escorted over to the set, which was maybe like a 10 minute walk. We were walked over to a little vintage clothes shop, which I actually looked it up. It is now called Fresh Cuts Clothing. I don't think it's a vintage thrift store now, but it may have been back, you know, in 2011, but it certainly was for the scene that was being shot in the movie. It was the thrift store where Jimi Hendrix bought his famous military jacket. This actually happened in London in real life, but this was the scene they were filming. So they bring us into the shop and there's a few people in the room. There's Andre Benjamin is there. So I got to like meet him kind of. We didn't actually speak but he was there and I remember him saying like you know after the director like had us in place and ready to go like before they were going to roll the cameras I remember Andre Benjamin standing behind us he was kind of like these girls are cool I dig them <laughs> I remember him specifically using the word dig and I was like Ooh. <laughs> so that was pretty cool me and the other girl and there was also a man who was kind of in directed in with us who was apparently the shop owner or the person who worked in the shop and we were the girls who were like shopping in the shop while Jimi Hendrix is also shopping for his jacket we were told to like look through the clothes and the it was me and the girl and then the man in between us and he's kind of like showing us clothes like what about this what about this or do you like this that was basically what we were directed to do and then there was also like obviously the director and there was camera guy and a sound guy. I think that's all I remember. So I don't know how long this took. I don't remember how long we were in there, but they did do several takes, obviously. And then obviously they got the take that they wanted. So we were escorted back to the dressing room. I do remember it being towards the evening time, but it was summertime, so it was still bright. But I remember it being quite late in the evening at this point. So we get back to the dressing room to, you know, D everything and get dressed again and leave. But when I get back, hair lady has gone home. The 10,000 pins she had to put in my hair, I had to take them all out by myself. And I remember them kind of rushing us maybe to like clear out. So I remember like in being in the bathroom, like furiously pulling all of these pins out of my wig and then like taking the wig off and handing it to a production assistant and being like, see ya. <laughs> so that was that. That was my part in the movie done. Or so I thought. Again, Another detail, I do not remember how this came to be. I don't remember how I got scheduled for another shoot day, but I did. This was done differently to the first time. This was a full long day thing. It was just one day, but I think, I believe it was like six or 7 a.m. until like 9 p.m. It was a really long day. Hair, makeup, costume in the morning, and then we were taken over to film afternoon in the evening. This was for a crowd scene that is set in the Savile, Saville or Savile Theatre, I'm not sure, but I think the Savile Theatre in London, actually filmed in Dublin. It is the scene where Jimi Hendrix experience plays for the Beatles. They play Sgt. Pepper's and there's Beatles lookalikes up on the top balcony. Although I will admit lookalikes, they didn't really look like the Beatles that much. So I was going to be in the crowd scene that was for like the theatre audience. And I remember there being like a full team, like a full hair, makeup, wardrobe production team because they had so many people to, to work on and to get through all in that morning. So I remember it being a very full on affair. They had a lot of people to get ready because it was pretty much the entire audience of the theater and I was just one of them. All of that took place in the Tivoli Theater on Francis Street. So that's where we were told to go in the morning and the Tivoli has now closed. I think that was during COVID that the Tivoli closed, which is very sad, the Tivoli on Francis Street. But that's where we were, we were pretty much inside the theatre sitting in the seats waiting to be called and the, all of the stage area was set up like tables and rows and rows of hair and makeup so eventually got my hair and makeup done then I got taken over to costumes and they put me in this green funky dress it was very very cool I have to say it I remember it being green and it had a lot of kind of floral like big floral patterns I might be remembering this wrong but that that is what I remember the only thing I was a bit uncomfortable about with the outfit was I remember it being very short. Again, 60s short style, but even shorter than the previous outfit to a point where like when I would sit down, I was like afraid to flash people. So I remember being in the theater, filming the scenes and like we had a lot of like standing up, sitting down, standing up, sitting down. And I remember being like, oh, I, like when I'd go to sit down, I'd like hold, 
<laughs> I'd hold the dress down over my backside because there were two lads sitting behind me and I was like, I'm definitely flatting them and I'm very uncomfortable. But I did my best. I think I did okay. But I just remember being very self-conscious in that outfit, even though I did love it. I just wished it was a little bit longer. Hair, makeup, costume done. We are all put into a bus and driven to the Olympia Theatre, which is just like, you know, five or 10 minutes, if even. Pull up outside the Olympia Theatre and we all pile in a bunch of 60s looking people. <laughs> and they do some crowd shots of people like walking into the theatre. I don't believe I was in any of these. I do remember like walking in while they were rolling, but I only remember seeing myself when I was actually in my seat. We're in our seats. The director is like telling us what he wants from us. It's basically a process of we walk into the theatre, you know, usual, like looking around, we take our seats, crowd gets restless and we kind of start, we're chatting amongst each other and there's a little bit of, you know, noise, crowd getting restless, that kind of thing. Jimi Hendrix comes on stage and we're supposed to be like, what? What is this? Hmm, bit of side eye, like, I'm not sure about this. And then as the song progresses, we get more and more excited and like into the music and like, oh my God, what we're witnessing is amazing. Jimi Hendrix is playing Sgt. Pepper for the Beatles. And then by the end, it's like full on applause. So that was pretty much the gist of what we had to do. How many takes did they do? They didn't do, they probably did like maybe five. I don't remember 100%. It could have been more. I don't think it was less. Again, memory is a weird thing. Watching back the movie, it being fully done, like the bit where he's like, watch out for your ears, watch out for your ears. Like I just, that's ingrained in my brain, seeing that in person. And I was just like, oh, it was so cool. I actually remembered forgetting myself quite a few times. And actually, this sounds weird to say, but thinking that I was watching Jimi Hendrix, even though I knew I wasn't. It was just one of those things where I was like, this is the closest I'll ever be to watching Jimi Hendrix. I don't know. It was... Very cool. And it wasn't, you know, obviously it was a track. They were miming to a track. So it's not like they were playing live music, but it was just so cool. Other than the like, hmm, at the beginning, I was not acting when I was like, yay. <laughs> they did the scene a few times and that was a wrap. And I actually remember them like, a few of the production staff came up onto the stage and like addressed the theater with the curtains closed. And were like, this was the last scene we had to film. So if it, you are officially seeing that's a wrap, we are done. This is the final scene we had to film. So big clap, that was pretty cool. And that was pretty much it. So now I'm so looking forward to this part. I'm sure you are too. I am going to show you the scenes that I was in. The clips are actually on YouTube. The, the film itself you'd have to rent or buy. And I'm not sure what streaming platforms it's on if anyone wanted to watch it. But the actual scenes that I'm in happen to be on YouTube. So I will show them to you now. I'll point me out. And I'll also just link them in, in the description if you wanna just watch them yourself. So this is the outside of the shop and there's that's the back of my head right there that's and wait I'm, I'm behind her there's me shopping <laughs> all right I'm gonna go back and just like pause it I'll just show you some stills okay so that's the shop from the outside and actually I don't know if that's the actual location or if that's in London it probably is in London I would say but that's the other girl on the left and then the man in the middle and that is the top of my head the back of my head in my brown wig. So that was the first shot there. And then I am standing behind her. I, re I remember all this happening. There I am, there's me, shopping for clothes. Editing me here again, second and final extra thing I wanted to add in. So another thing I discovered while editing that this is also Hayley Atwell in this scene. I don't know why that never registered with me. I obviously knew that she was in the movie, but I didn't put it together that she was in this particular scene with me. And of course now, I know her from the latest Mission Impossible movie, among lots of other things, but it's only now that I'm realizing that this was her. And I did a scene with her 11 years ago and I never knew. And if I'd never made this video, I probably would have never put that together. So that's really cool. Since I just discovered that, I wanted to add that in. Let's get back to the video. Also, I didn't remember them having uh, the Union Jack bunting in the store. But yeah, I suppose that would signify London. So that's the first clip. That's the, the clothing store scene. And now we're gonna show you the Sgt. Pepper's clip from the live theater show. 
There's me in the crowd right there. That's one shot. My hair looks very similar <laughs> to what it does right now. <clears throat> there I am as well. That's me right there. <laughs> and quick shot of me there again. I actually love this scene. <laughs> There is a very clear shot of me in the crowd. Um, pointed out to you in just a sec. There I am, right there. That's me. It's so funny. I, I remember like seeing this with my own eyes. So it's quite funny to see it in like a finished, produced project. So at that point we had to really applause when he was like down on his knees. They're the Beatles. So that's the scene. It's actually a very cool scene. I really like it a lot. And let me go back and just point you, point me out to you, not the other way around. There was a couple of crowd shots. It was, it was one actually from the stage that was quite good. There's me right there. I know it's a little hard to see, but that is me. There was another previous one to that. Actually, I missed one. Yeah, there's me as well. And finally, during the song, there's a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good shot. Right there, that's me just behind the drummer's hands. And I'm supposed to be like, what the hell is this? What's happening? Okay, so now I'm thinking, should I do a cover of this version of Sgt. Pepper? I never thought about that until just now. And I can hear it. That is so exciting. I think I might have to add that to the list. I really, really want to do that. So that's what happened. My claim to fame. <laughs> I know I wasn't like a huge part of the movie in any way, but it was a really just cool and fun experience. It was my very own Jimi Hendrix experience. <laughs> I made myself cringe. Okay, thank you so much for watching this video. If you watched it all the way through, I really do appreciate it. I know this was probably a bit long, but it was a long story had to be told. So I hope you really enjoyed it. Leave a like on the video if you did enjoy it. Subscribe if you haven't already and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think. Also make sure that you hit the notification bell so that you don't miss when I post a video, whether it's one of my cover songs, when I go live every week or a vlog or a guitar short, make sure you hit the bell so that you don't miss out. There are also some links in the description if you would like to support me further. I have a Patreon, I have a YouTube membership community, and I also have a merch store with lots of music and Irish inspired designs. This actually, and my hair has been covering it for the whole video, but this is part of my new Christmas merch line. This is kind of a sample order. So the actual product looks a little better than this and a little bit more centered and the text is more is larger and pops out more. This was just a sample product, but it's it's comfy, so I'm gonna keep it. <laughs> Christmas music is my love language. If that resonates with you, or if you think somebody you know might like that for a gift, link in the description to check that out. Also, I do need to let you know if you're watching this video the day it goes up on the 10th of December, that today is the last day to purchase merch to get in time for Christmas. So just keep that in mind. If you do wanna get something, you have to do it by midnight tonight to your time or else it will probably arrive after Christmas more than likely. Just wanted to let you know. If you do decide to become a Patreon or a member, you will get your name in the credits of my videos. You will also have access to a monthly private live stream that we do and you also get access to behind the scenes content as well. So if you'd like to join, buy merch, all linked below. I will also link the two videos from today as well, the clothes shop scene and the theater scene from All Is By My Side if you'd like to watch them yourself. But anyone who chooses to support me, I really do appreciate it a lot. Thank you so much again for watching this video. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day wherever you are in the world and I will see you very soon in another video. Bye.